Hello everybody, we're back for episode 47 of The Horror Guys, where we talk about horror movies and stuff. Did we see any horror movies lately? We saw a whole bunch of things oh, this we week. We've seen a lot of horror movies. It's a big movies. week. Yes. I even finished a horror book. A book? A book, yeah. It was like on paper and had words on it. It was really cool. Yeah. Isn't that kind of slow? Didn't have to plug it in or anything. Yeah, it's a lot slower than a movie. Huh, But okay. it was a good one. Yeah. Well, movie-wise, we watched, what did we see? Anything the mystery, good? mystery of Edwin Drood. Well, the, anything good? Well, <laughs> we'll see. Starting out with that, 1935. Yeah. And a short, shortish, uh, called Stray from 2019. Mm -hmm. Freaks from 1932. Way back. A, a very controversial film at the time, and kind of still. Uh, morbid Stories. An indie film from 2019. Mm -hmm. And a version of Phantom of the Opera from 1962. Another one. Color. Yes. Yes. And a bonus movie, The Fair, from 2019. Oh, yeah. But that one wasn't horror, so... That's yeah, why it's that's, a bonus movie. That's why it's a bonus movie? Okay. You watching good TV this week? <clears throat> we started The Boys. We saw all of Stranger Things th third season. Oh, yeah. Which was really Stranger good. Things season three. Yes. Yeah. Highly recommended. We don't do a lot of TV on here, but we, we watch a lot of TV. So yeah, yeah, definitely recommend. Yeah, I forgot about that. I recommend both the Stranger Things and the Boys. They're both good. Yeah, the Boys is not horror. It's uh, superheroes. Superheroes, pretty graphic, pretty yeah. Not your usual superheroes, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if the Justice League were jerks? Uh, jerks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, anyway, mentioned last week that we have a phone number, 937-453-1575. Call in, leave us a voicemail. We'd the love to hear your comments. have been pouring in. Not really, but you, know, you can be the first. <laughs> <laughs> or email us at horrorguysmail at gmail.com. We have gotten some emails, and that's a good thing. But there's a lot, of talk, a lot to talk about, so here we go. What's first? We started out with the mystery of Edmund Drood. Edwin. What'd I just say? Edmund. Him too. Edwin. <laughs> twin brother. Yeah. Edwin. You want to confuse somebody? Have twin boys. Call them Edmund and Edwin. Oh, yeah. This was Edwin Drood. It was based on a novel by Charles Dixon. Dickens. Dixons? Who? Now, <laughs> yeah, I can, uh, now I'm going to get you I can't get, get the names right it. either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he died in 1870 and the book wasn't finished. Kind of, you know, a mystery and there's no ending. So since then, people have interpreted it themselves and made different versions, and this is somebody's interpretation, and they kind of finished it. Yeah. Poor Dickens. It's it's kind of loosely based on what he wrote. but Directed you know. by Stuart Walker, written by Leopold Atlas, John Balderston, stars Claude Rains, Douglas Montgomery, Heather Angie, Angie, I don't know, one hour, 27 minutes, link in the show notes to pick up your affiliate link copy from Amazon. First of all, did you like it? It was okay. I would give it a very strong, yeah, okay. And my first not great, my not first, bad. My first note that I have is WTF. This story isn't horror. Eh, it's got its horror I mean, points. It, uh, no, not really. For 1935, like oh, drug use, uh, shocking. Uh. There was drug use. There was fallen church members. There was murder. There was disguises. There was deception. There oh. were crypts and cemeteries and grave robbing. Yeah, that's about as horror as you get in 1935. I suppose. Yeah. I mean, what did the Phantom of the, the original <clears throat> Phantom of the Opera do? He killed a couple of people. That was horror. And he was ugly. I yeah. Mean, and, and yeah. <laughs> not terribly horrifying. Hmm. Times change and horror changes with it. I didn't like it very much. Yeah, it was kind of bland. Bland. Bland and dated. We start out with Jasper, played by Claude Rains, who is always good in everything, hmm. having a bad dream about a bunch of people in a church. He wakes up and we see that he's in an opium den. He leaves and we cut away to him in the choir at church. Turns out he leads the choir at church. But he double, doubles over coughing during his solo. Living a double life. Yeah, and apparently the opium's catching up with him. He can't sing a high note. He's been going up to London twice a week for treatment. Mm -hmm. And his nephew, Edwin Drood, opium comes by treatment. for a visit. It quickly becomes obvious that Jesper has a crush on Edwin's friend Rosa. His mm. fiance Rosa. Rosa Bud. <laughs> That's her name. Yeah, it yeah. is. Jasper's been giving her music lessons in his spare time. 
Eddie and Rosa go for a walk, and they have to deal with chaperones and silly guardians. I don't know what year this was supposed to be taking place. Did you catch that anywhere? It wasn't 1935. Um, you know, I don't think I did. Okay. No, Somewhere but, but in the vague early, British early. past. Yes. Perhaps 1870 when the book was written. Very likely. Neville and his sister Helena ride to town, and Neville meets Rosa on the trip. They go to meet Mr. Chris Sparkle, Eddie's new tutor. All the various characters meet each other at Mr. Chris Sparkle's house for dinner. Neville gets on very well with Rosa, and Jasper gives him the stink eye all evening. After the girl he's got a crush on. Mm -hmm. Neville admits to Chris Sparkle that he has violent tendencies and once pulled a knife on his father. You know, if you do something like that, shut up about it. Yeah, don't tell people. Don't, don't brag about it. Net later, Neville and Edwin nearly come to blows over Rosa, but the fight is broken up by Jasper, who is obviously the voice of reason. <laughs> Rosa confesses that she's terrified of Jasper. His image follows her around like a ghost. He stares at her way too much, as if he were threatening her. Neville pulls a knife on Drood, and then he confesses it to Mr. Chris Sparkle. The last story gets passed on and exaggerated all over town, but when he explains it, Rosa forgives him. Yeah, it's like a game of telephone where it gets more exaggerated every time. And he threw an entire he he pointed an entire a knife tea at him. Set at, yeah. and threw an entire tea set <laughs> at him. And then, yeah. You know, <laughs> Rosa and Eddie decide that maybe the wedding isn't such a great idea, and they decide to break off the wedding. They decide not to tell Jasper right now, as it might spoil his Christmas. Jasper goes to see Dirtles, the caretaker of the cemetery. I want a name like Dirtles. Dirtles. He's been... And he talked about himself in the third person. Dirtles does this, and Dirtles does that. <laughs> He's been promised a tour of the crypts, and now is the time. Down in the crypt is a pool of quicklime. Quicklime. It's quick enough to eat your bones, Dirtle says. He shows him some tombs that are empty and some that are full. Dirtle, Dirtles is quite... keep on to say turtles. Dirtle. Dirtles the turtle is quite drunk, and he passes out during the tour. Jasper steals his keys and makes copies of them. He's got the, the wax and the impressions. And then tucks them back in and then wakes the guy up. Yeah. Morning comes, and Jasper runs to Chris Sparkle, wanting to know what happened to his nephew whom he last saw walking with Neville after the party last night. It's the mystery of Edwin Drood who killed him. Although in this, it's pretty obvious. I, yeah, I we, we know. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't really much of a mystery. Neville yeah. is captured and arrested. Neville doesn't know what happened to Eddie. They drag the river, but they don't find a body. They do find Edwin's watch, and they, and they all take that as a sign that he's dead. Jasper learns that Edwin and Rose's wedding had been called off, and he just faints right there on the floor. He killed the guy for nothing. Hmm. Jasper confronts Rosa and admits his love for her. Neville also admits he loves her, but he can't act on it until he proves his innocence. They haven't arrested Neville since there still isn't a body. At some point, though, mm -hmm. wouldn't they arrest him anyway? Just because you hid the body real good doesn't get you off the hook. But he might not be dead. Yeah, maybe. There's that habeas corpus thing. No. Neville and can't, Mr. Grugius. It's hard to, hard to yeah. try somebody for murder if you, you can't prove that it was murder. Been in jail for can't 20 years. Can't prove that they're dead. Drood comes back. Yeah. yeah. Neville and Mr. Grugius find Jasper's opium equipment and also the mold for the key that opens the tomb. Meanwhile, Jasper goes back to the opium den and he admits what he did to the old woman who runs the place. He's upset for killing Edwin for no reason. The old woman is later found dead in Jasper's home. Sobers up and regretted telling her. Mm -hmm. Neville goes to see Dirtles, and he wants a tour of the crypts as well. The tomb, and Neville now is dressed up like this really old hunchback man with a white beard, and no one in town catches on. And that is a pretty good, believable disguise. I it thought, I thought. was. Yeah. Probably better than you would get in real life without a Hollywood studio behind you. Yeah, yeah. Better than, better than Superman with his glasses being Clark Kent. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, you know, a step above. Really a disguise. It's me, Superman. What? Who are you? <laughs> Where'd I, Brian go? I'm right here. I'm Superman. <laughs> oh. Now I'm Brian. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. But Neville, he's got this beard and hat, and he's been, I didn't recognize him at first. Yeah. But yeah, yeah it really mm -hmm. is him. Mm -hmm. So he wants a tour of the crypts as well, says this old man. <clears throat> the tomb that was empty before isn't empty now, and Dirtles can tell the difference. Neville digs the grave open while Jasper sneaks up behind him. They fight while the villagers arrive. 
Neville and Dirtles accuse Jasper, who then runs off into the bell tower. He jumps off the tower and is killed. Later on, Neville and Rosa get married. The end. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. That sums it up. Stuff happened. This was Charles Dickens' final unfinished story. And for, for all that stuff happened, and I kept thinking, this should be better. <laughs> A lot happens. <laughs> like all those elements you said. But it's really kind of bland. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I'm not familiar with the original story, so I was watching this film with no preconceptions. A lot of things just seem to happen for no reason are not really explained. The blurb on the box describes Jasper as an opium-addicted choir master. Yet the opium and him being a choir master, master have almost nothing to do with the plot. No, no, not really. There's a five-minute mm-hmm. segment where he goes to the opium den and admits what he does and kills the old lady, but if they'd have cut that, it wouldn't have made any real difference. It's mentioned several times that Neville is either Indian, black, or somehow a person of color, but he's clearly but just a regular British man with slightly a, dark makeup. Yeah, that was, and not even really dark makeup. If you look at him compared to everybody else, he's a little darker, like maybe he's got a tan or something. I guess Neville's ethnic background is just one more reason for everyone mm. to assume he was guilty of murder. He's the outsider. I guess. When he leaves town yeah. and returns disguised as an old man, the makeup has done well for a film. But I wonder how many people in real life would have been fooled. I've never seen anyone in makeup that I wouldn't recognize in person, and this movie trope has always confounded me. Mm-hmm. Claude Ga- here's, a, here's a neat coincidence. Claude Rains was giving music lessons to a girl whom he secretly was in love with, who was also engaged to another man, and then murders for her, and then is snubbed when he confesses his love. Sound familiar? Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> the same movie he was going to be in a few <laughs> later, years later. This was before Phantom of the Opera that he was in. <laughs> hmm. But, you know, it was like seven years later, he was in there Phantom, Phantom of the Opera there, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very similar. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Speaking of similar to the Phantom of the Opera... The actual Phantom Fast of the Opera. Fast forward a few more years, 1962. <laughs> 1962. Directed Her- by Herbert Terrence Lom. The Hammer playing. version. Yeah. Yeah, we had the Lon Chaney version and the Claude Rains version were both by Universal, like 20 years apart. And then 20-ish years later, Hammer tried it. It's Hammer time. That never gets old. Herbert Lom was really a very versatile actor. You know, this and yeah. um, Pink Panther is all I think I've ever seen him in. Oh, I've seen him in lots of other stuff. I mean, I couldn't name him, but, you know. I mean, he was good in those yeah. two things, but, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You couldn't name him. Okay. Yeah, well, you know. He's a great actor. He's oh, a great what have actor. you seen? Well, uh, this I, thing and that thing. I, I don't know. <laughs> Directed by Terrence Fisher, written by Anthony Hines and Gaston LaRue, stars Herbert Lahn, Heather Sears, and Edward D'Souza, hour and 24 minutes. If you want to see it? We got the Amazon link. And, of course, we start out with a man, a little hunchback man watching a bigger man in a mask play the organ. Credits roll. I yeah, guess that was just this, enough intro that we're supposed to be creeped out. This Phantom has a mini-me. Well, he's not really a mini-me, but a, a, a hench, hench person. He's got his little a, Igor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A little person who is his hench person. He didn't look that little. He, I mean, the, the credits descri- describe him as the dwarf. Mm-hmm. He didn't look that small. Just a guy who kind of bent over. Well, Nick and me, I'm and, a dwarf. And very short. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Well, it's the first performance of a brand new opera, Joan of Arc. The poster has been slashed. The main drummer's drum has been wrecked. The conductor's music has gone missing. Hmm. Maria, the lead, thinks she saw a phantom in her room. Phantom Things of the aren't going well. The show starts on schedule anyway. Lord Darcy, who wrote the opera, stands and enjoys the admiration of the crowd. He is so talented. Hmm. Lord Darcy asks why the box across the way is empty, and his manager, Latimer, says, There have been complaints. People who sit, sit there see strange things. Now the show continues until a hanged man tears through the curtain and nearly swings into Maria. He's dead. Yeah. Maria says she's had enough of this crap and quits. <laughs> she nopes out of there. That is not a good yeah. place to work. Har- harsh environment. As Hunter, the producer, auditions for a new soprano, he finds a new girl named Christine, and the Phantom watches her from the shadows. Lustfully. Lord Darcy invites her to dinner. As she sits alone in her dressing room, she hears a voice from somewhere. He warns her about Darcy, and explains that she will be singing just for him, and he'll help her. (laughs) Yep. As expected, Darcy gets creepy, requiring her to go back to his apartment if she wants the lead role. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. 
Me too. <laughs> Way mm-hmm. back. Mm-hmm. Hunter intervenes and rescues her. She tells Hunter about the man whose voice she heard earlier. They go back to her dressing room to see if they can find that voice. The voice comes back, telling Hunter to leave things alone. Go while you may. On the way out, they see the rat catcher, who is attacked and killed by someone who puts an ice pick through his eye. All right. Mm -hmm. Hunter goes off in pursuit of the killer, while the Phantom introduces himself to Christine in person. He has a papier-mâché-looking mask that resembles a one-eyed Michael Myers. Yeah, and this one is different in that regard. It's a full uh, face mask. Yeah, with one eye missing. With only just one eye, but uh, the violence being done, most of it is not done by the Phantom. He doesn't really. Do... My comments on that come a little later. But yeah, the yeah. Phantom doesn't hurt anybody here. Yeah, yeah. His, his. The next day, Darcy and Hunter argue, and Hunter gets fired, as does Christine. Hunter spots some music on a piece of furniture, and the landlady says it was written by Professor Petrie, who used to live there. She shows more of his music to Hunter, who plays it on the piano. Professor Petrie was burned to death in a fire at the printer's. No, he wasn't. Hunter goes to see the old printer, who says, no, no one died. One man broke in and knocked over a lamp and was badly burned. He ran out screaming, and no one ever saw him again. To get no body. Mm-hmm. Hunter and Christine go to see the police about the man, and they say he ran away and jumped in the river right after he was burned so many years ago. Hunter explains that he thinks Darcy stole the music that Petri wrote and is passing it off as passing it off as his own. He recognized the tune that the landlady showed him earlier. Mm-hmm. Turns Not out like plagiarism. Turns out that's the case. Professor yeah. Petri's plagiarism problem. Mm -hmm. That evening, the Phantom's own version of Igor captures Christine and takes her to the Phantom's underground lair. He explains that he's going to teach Christine how to sing. Meanwhile, Darcy... Whether she wants to or not. (laughs) She doesn't really want to. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of by force. Yeah, smacks her around a little bit. Yeah, yeah, she's... Yeah, literally, he sings her, drives her to the point of exhaustion and, you know, (laughs) slaps her. (laughs) Yeah, that's going to be good. Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. Darcy fires pretty much everyone, and Latimer tells him he should hire Hunter back because things ran more smoothly with him there. Hunter just happens to walk in right then, and he's back in charge. A little later, someone notices that, hey, you know, Christine isn't around anymore. What happened to her? Huh. Hunter goes looking for her and hears her voice coming from the sewer. Could be the mutant turtles. Could be. He finds a way inside the barred up sewer and tracks down the phantom's lair. He fights with the phantom servant. Hunter calls the phantom Professor Petri and explains that the opera music is really his. We then get a flashback as Petri explains himself. Darcy offered him a paltry 50 pounds for all his work, and Petri knew he was getting ripped off, but he was desperate, so he took it. First thing he did was cross off Petri's name and put his own on it. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was supposed to just use the music, not steal it. Licensing, not buying yeah Yeah. petri finds out and sneaks in the printers that night he burns all the copies and pours acid on the printing plates the room accidentally catches on fire and so does he he jumps into the river and winds up living in the sewers with his unnamed dwarf companion we were already told most of this but now we get to see it as well in a flashback Mm -hmm. so we kind of get that story twice yeah petri still wants to train christine to sing he says if they'll give him a week he'll make her the greatest singer of all time So this is kind of voluntary at this point. Finally, it's the big night. They they say okay, and they they all live happily ever after down in the sewers for a week or two learning how to sing. Finally, it's the big night, and Christine is excellent on stage. The opera is a big success. The Phantom confronts Darcy, who runs out screaming. The dwarf gets chased up onto a chandelier, which breaks and falls. The Phantom pushes Christine out of the way and is killed when it falls on him. The end. And the dwarf dies, too. Yeah. It's a mutual. Did the dwarf die? Yeah, he was on the chandelier. I thought he jumped off the last minute. No, I don't think so. I'm not really sure now. Okay. Well, anyway, the Phantom dies by saving Christine. Mm-hmm. It's very colorful. Lots of, it's, it's a yeah, hammer he's, film. He's more of a tragic figure in this one and not the cold-blooded killer. People die, but not by him. It's the dwarf doing all the killing. Mm -hmm. It's not entirely clear that the Phantom even knows about the deaths. 
I think that the Phantom knows about things like the drum being broken and the music being stolen. He's behind all that. Mm -hmm. But the deaths, like the rat catcher and the man on stage, might be the dwarf doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. it it's vague. We're, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, once again, there's lots of singing, but at least this one, this one has all the songs in English, which is nice for once. It is Not nice. all that Latin opera from the old ones. The Phantom isn't Christine's father, and he's not in love with her either. He simply wants revenge on Darcy. We never see him get revenge on Darcy, which I thought was the weak point of the movie. He shows yeah. him his face, and, and Darcy, Darcy goes, runs, oh, runs, runs out, and yeah. that's all we ever see of him. Yeah. I mean, he, if he ran out on the street and got run over by a carriage or something, that would have been enough. Mm -hmm. No. We never see him kill anyone. The dwarf does all the dirty work. It is entertaining and different from the others, and Lum is probably the classiest phantom we've seen so far. Mm-hmm. I liked it. I overall, liked it. Overall, liked it. Yeah. Which of the three phantoms do you like best so far? The Lon Chaney one. The first one, the silent yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, I like that one best. Well, of all of them, I like the musical the best. I'm going to have to watch that someday, just because I don't remember it. <laughs> mm-hmm. See any shorts this week? We saw one called Stray, mm. an indie film from 2019. Brand new, yes. Yeah, and it was very good. I liked it. A different take on werewolves. No. And no. yeah, this one's uh, directed by Daniel R. Black, Ryan Convery, written by Daniel R. Black. Stars Paul Kendarian, Morgan Boss Maltese, Luke Crory, and Lakeisha Gebhard. It's a 33 minute short, so not super short. Not, not a short short. Very short filmish. Yeah. Do you like it? I did. I liked it a lot. I did, too. Yeah, very good. A girl runs through the swamp and passes out. It's not really a swamp. It's kind of a pondy, well, foresty backyard. Yeah, just somebody's backyard. Yeah. And then the no. credits roll. A father and his two children wake up chained to walls in a basement. Jack comes down the steps, and they know him. The father says he'll get 20 years for this. Turns out Jack is a policeman, and he asks about Stacy. Hmm. Change the scene. And then we find Eleven out months Stacey. ago, we see that Stacy is in the hospital, and Jack is outside waiting for the doctor. He is her grandfather, and he found Stacy unconscious in his backyard. She's been attacked by an animal. Turns out that was her we saw collapsing before the credits. Mm -hmm. She wakes up and has iridescent eyes. And at this point, I already had it figured out. Yeah. She goes home and watches the crescent moon rise, in case you didn't already have it figured out. She's angry because her grandmother <laughs> left J left Jack years ago and took Stacy's mother with her. We don't know what happened back then, but they're both dead now. And Jack admits he was an asshole and regrets what he did back then. Wants to make amends, wants to do better. Yeah. He was not a not such a good guy in the past, but seems to have turned things around. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that turned it around theme going on here. Yeah. One night, Jack goes to work and the lights start going crazy. There's a full moon outside, and we hear growling inside the house. And that's a different thing. That, and, and they use it as a plot device, too, because, you know, when somebody's changing, the, there's an electrical effect. Yeah. Which I've never seen that in werewolves before. Yeah, werewolves are usually more of a medical curse thing mm -hmm. than, you know, magic, that yeah. kind of deal. Yeah. But this one does. The, yeah. the lights blink every, and every, flash. Everything electrical starts fritzing out yeah. and going dark. And we hear yeah. growling inside the house. The next morning, Jack returns and finds blood all over the floor. The dog is missing, and Stacy is in the bathroom trying to wash off all the blood. Mm -hmm. We then come back to the present, and Jack says the lawyer and his two children will all be dead in 16 minutes if they don't help him. We then flash back and see how Jack and Stacy deal with her new problem. That's all I'm going to say. That's all you should say. And I thought this looked really good and was very well acted. Mm -hmm. The sound, lighting, and direction here are all really good and could stand up against any regular movie or TV episode. We see a lot of somewhat crappy looking shorts this year. Mm -hmm. And this is not one of them. This looks really this good. really top notch. From the length and of the, the credits. The creature is shown just enough. Yeah, yeah, not a lot yeah, of the creature. Yeah, but it's really, I mean, that, that's really effective look, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from the length of the credits, there were a lot of people involved with this. It's not your typical short film. Paul looks maybe a little too old to be an active-duty policeman, and Stacy looks a little yeah. too old to be walking to school with the lawyer's daughter. Yeah, but moving past that, that they were yeah. both good in the roles. Yes, yes, they were. Yeah. And I had the main plot pretty much pegged when I saw the iridescent eyes. Yeah, it didn't feel like there were 
a lot of surprises because you kind of knew how it was going to unfold, but it was fascinating watching it unfold. It's obvious that it's a werewolf movie from, yeah. from very early on. Pretty obvious, but yeah. But the, the interesting part is seeing um, <clears throat> how they deal with it. Yeah. We always yeah. laugh about Lon Chaney looking up at the sky and saying, oh my God, it's a full moon. Like he didn't know that was coming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly. You, know. you do know when the full moon's coming and you can prepare for it. And they do. And they yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, still fun to watch it unfold. Jack's birthday gift to Stacy got a laugh out of both of us. Mm-hmm. And the way the story is broken up works really well as, as well. This may not be the best short we've seen this year, but it is way up there on the list. Mm-hmm. And we're going to have to do a top 10 list when December's over. Several yeah. top ten lists, probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. So did you read any books this week? I read The Fisherman by John Langham. And boy, the was that fisherman. good. Yeah. What's it about, um, roughly? Uh, a fisherman. <laughs> that sounds exciting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, a guy, Abe, starts out telling the story of what happened. And he goes through, his, he, he lost his wife, and then he got into fishing as a hobby, and then he... It's a book or a country music song? Yeah, it's a, it's a book, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, palled up with uh, a co-worker who suffered some losses of his own, and then they go fishing in a very bad place, and magical bad things happen, and yeah, it's just creepy and scary and yeah, unsettling and... Really, really good. And just kind of draws you along. It's kind of a spoiler because you know that Abe makes it to the end because he's telling the story of what happened. But does everybody make it? And this is a fairly recent book? Um, Yeah. Yeah, just the last few years. Okay. Yeah. Really good. I'd recommend it. All righty. Okay. We're moving from a newish book to a brand new movie. Seen any morbid stories lately? Yeah, yeah, we saw one called Mor- Morbid Stories. <laughs> Directed by Asif Akbar and Will Devokes. Devokes? I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. Writers uh, Asif Akbar and Phil Herman. Stars Courtney Akbar, Crystal Pixie Adams, and Tyree Cobbins. Hour and 17 minutes. And you can watch this one for free on Amazon Prime. Link below. Did you like it? Yeah. Overall. What I saw it. Overall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a girl, Candy, cooks... I, I, should I confess? Why? I thought I'll be nodding a lot on this one. I was very, very tired when, when this was on. And I nodded off. <laughs> and I, and I, missed, I missed some of it. <laughs> I saw all this one. But he saw all of it. I read all about it. <laughs> you read my review. <laughs> I read his review, and I read all the stuff online about it. Filled in the gaps. <laughs> wow. And you I, never hear and Siskel I, and Ebert saying, I've been to sleep on this, but here's my review. <laughs> and I, I hesitate to say that, because it doesn't mean I hated it. <laughs> Didn't keep you awake nights either, did it? No, I was tired. Well, was there's very, this, very tired. <laughs> this girl, Candy, who cooks bacon and eggs for who two dogs named tea and biscuits oh and it's not just bacon oh these two dogs eat better breakfast than i do fancy little dishes and little garnish and yeah it's eggs and bacon and something on the side gourmet breakfast for them yeah i thought she was making breakfast for herself yeah yeah, it into little bowls and yeah that's something (laughs) she's recently had a breakup with her boyfriend and she's moving out heading back to her parents house many hours away the gas on her stove suddenly goes out and her phone loses signal She turns on the radio and hears that there's been some kind of an attack on the U.S. Flashback. Thirteen hours earlier, there's a knock at this couple's door, and the couple wakes up. It's some weird old guy with long, creepy, stringy hair who is with his three strange buddies. The girlfriend can't see any of them on the security camera, and unsurprisingly, these four guys aren't what they appear. I liked how they kept pressing to get invited in. Did you, yeah, did I you didn't catch really that? even catch that. You're yeah, right, though. Yeah. That was what they were wanting. I mean, they could they could have overpowered the one guy at the door easily. Yeah. They they apparently couldn't come in until he could. They conjoled him. That's a point I didn't into, notice. Yes, yeah, I thought that was neat. Yeah. And then we go back, and Candy and her dogs decide to drive into town to see what's going on. But then, 24 hours earlier, Mallory is babysitting her three brothers and sisters when her friends come over. The three teens pull out a Ouija board and get to work talking to ghosts. 
That doesn't work, and Mallory's boyfriend asks her to run away with him. The third friend goes into the bathroom, and someone else is in there with her. Hmm. Meanwhile, Candy hears on the radio that the dead are said to be coming back to life. She's out in the desert, so she doesn't see anyone. 24 hours earlier, a writer named Robert Zern is complaining about the rustic cabin that his assistant rented for him. He says it looks like something out of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He's not having any luck on his new book, and he hears something rattling around up on the roof. The landlord comes by and explains that they don't have any cable, but he doesn't know what those noises are that the writer's been hearing. The man explains that if the writer hears anything else, don't try to fix it himself, but to call him right away. Zern really hates this place, but it's raining too hard to leave. He notices that there's a calendar on the wall that says Friday is feeding day. Mm -hmm. He hears the bumping upstairs again and goes to investigate. Don't do it. Candy then continues driving through the desert, listening to the zombie reports on the radio. Meanwhile, a woman named Morgan eats a rare steak, which she promptly pukes up. She's sick and in pain. She injects herself with something that puts a smile on her face. I, I assume it's just drugs of mm -hmm. some kind. Yeah, I believe so. She's yeah. a vampire who runs outside and bites an old man who turns out to be a zombie. What happens when a vampire bites a zombie? Weird what happens things. when a zombie bites the vampire back? <laughs> Well, we find out. Her boyfriend comes over and he brings her a sandwich. Hot ham and cheese on garlic bread. Bad move. <laughs> they watch a movie while she gets sicker and sicker. Hmm. Meanwhile, Candy drives on. The radio guy says all the big cities are burning. And then his door breaks down and he goes silent. She thinks she sees her ex-boyfriend on the road and stops for him. She finds him, but it's not really him. The end. That's not the end. Yeah. And I didn't actually give too many spoilers there. Yeah, you didn't. Well, the locations and stories are all good, but the acting is pretty atrocious overall. They put the indie back in indie film. Oh. Will Devo Keys and Courtney Akbar, who played Zern and Candy, were both fine in their roles, but all the others were pretty horrible actors. Most of the actors couldn't even say their lines without an embarrassed look on their faces. That's a bad sign. See, I missed that. All, 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 the, all the young okay. people... Mm -hmm. We're just, I don't know, college students or high school kids. And it's like, yeah, I made a movie. And they couldn't stop smiling. Yeah, I'm scared. I'm terrified. It's horrible. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I want to hope that it wasn't that bad. All those ones with the babysitter were. Yeah, oh. it really was. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Um, um, in some scenes in the segment with the Ouija board and the babysitter, the lighting seems to get bright and dark randomly, as if someone didn't know how to light a scene properly. It's like they had to go back and do a reshoot, but it was mm. dark outside, so they oh. didn't bother changing the lights. Whoops. Yeah, it was very noticeable in that one. Uh, as if someone didn't know how to light a scene properly. The writer and the director did good work, but it looks like they just couldn't afford any real actors. So they did the best they could with the money and resources the resources they had? A movie. Indie movie. Mm. It's okay. got some jump scares, which are usually kind of annoying, but these were well-timed and not excessive. There is some gore in the story with the writer and Morgan the vampire, but overall there's not a lot of gore. Uh, there was also a, a creature in the writer's story that we didn't get a great look at, but I hear there was more to that that got cut out. Oh, okay. Again, this was well-written and very low budget, of course, and I did like it despite the bad acting, and I kind of liked it a lot more than Horror Hotel that we saw a few weeks back, which was also a low-budget movie. Hmm. If I had hmm. to guess, I'd say that other one had a bigger budget than this. Hmm. I like this one better. Hmm. Are you freaking happy? I'm freaking happy. I'm just freaking over here. Freaking out. Freaks. Mm, 1932's Freaks. And we, we watched the Serbian film. We watched the grotesque film. And we got a couple coming up in the next few months. And this was on the same list of top ten most horrifying, disgusting, grossest, nasty movies you ever want to see. Well, it bothered a lot of people. It must have been Still pretty, pretty extreme at the time. <clears throat> I thought it was good, but I didn't mm -hmm. think it was anything like grotesque or Serbian film. Not really. I recommend that everybody watch this one. It's good. Yeah, and fascinating seeing it because it, it's real people with real uh, issues. Yeah, yeah, there are, yeah. There's no special effects in this. Yeah. Directed by Todd Browning, the guy who did the original Dracula and a few other things. Written by Clarence Aaron Robbins and Willis Goldbeck. Stars Wallace Ford, Layla Hyams, and Olga Baklanova. Blame it on the Baklanova. Baklanova. <laughs> One hour, four minutes. Link in the show notes. 
And we start off with a non-politically correct note. I'm going to refer to most of the cast of the film as freaks because that's what the title of the movie is and that's what they're called throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. I know it's not politically correct, but in 1932, that's what it was. That's how it was, yeah. So we start out watching a carnival barker giving a speech that leads the people over to see the first freak in their show. We don't get to see a look, get a look at her yet, but the man says that she used to be a beautiful acrobat, but then something happened to her. And something. the screen gets all wavy because it's flashback time. Yeah, huh? We move to the past, where Hans and Frida, a couple of well-dressed, squeaky-voiced dwarves... They really are squeaky boys. They kind of talk like Mickey and teeny, Minnie Mouse. Te- yeah, teeny tiny. Would you think that's real? Or are they putting it on? No, I think that was their real voices. Yeah. Children don't talk like that, and they're, they're small like that. I don't I don't know yeah. what caused it, but yeah. It, he, he was three foot three, and she was about his height, too. They, yeah. they, and they were both munchkins in The Wizard of Oz, not surprisingly, too. Yeah, that doesn't yeah. surprise me. I, that, yeah. I think everybody that size who was alive at that time was a munchkin. <laughs> they needed so many of them. How many you need? Oh, send them all over. Send them all. Anybody short, send them all. So the two dwarves watch Cleopatra the acrobat perform, and Hans likes her while Frida is jealous. The next day, we see landowners come around to run the freak show staff off his property. And there's three pinheads and three dwarves, along with a normal-looking caretaker out in the woods. The man another, feels pity. another politically incorrect term to pinheads, which is what they're. I don't know to what the, the proper movie. term is. Microcephalic. Okay. Small brained, small head, small. Their their brain is underdeveloped, and and often, the skull is, squattier, you know, or pointed. Well, mm-hmm. the, the you know. Well, especially and, with the haircuts they have. In well, the and then they do the haircuts to accentuate, you yeah. know, just a little top knot on top to make it look more pointy. Three hydrocephalics anyway. and three dwarves, <laughs> along with a normal-looking caretaker. The, the man feels pity for them and, and allows them to stay. The strong man and the transvestite, that's all he was, right? Just a man who wore women's clothes? No, he was a half-man, half-woman. He said he was a hermaphrodite. No, was, the one the one with half and half was oh oh the yes yes he the was other guy. yes he was a trans, trans I think he was just a man in just a, a transvestite okay. yeah that was that was his act yeah he would he would do an act in drag yeah yeah there was a half and oh, half yeah, also I, that's I, not the same that's not the character I meant right he was married to the one the yeah. strong man and the transvestite joke about the half man half woman yeah Venus breaks up with Hercules the strong man and she whines in front of Froso the clown. Froso leaves and stops to talk to the Siamese twins. Hercules... Who really were a pair of Siamese twins. Everybody in yeah. this movie that I describe mm-hmm. is what I say they are. There's no special yeah. effects. Uh-huh. Her- da- Daisy and Violet Hilton joined at the hip. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Hercules stops by Cleopatra's tent and has a drink with her. She fixes him eggs. How many do you want? She asks. I'm not hungry. How about six? <laughs> he sees Venus outside and goes out and punches her in the face. Yeah. Don't know what just, that was about. Yeah, that was weird. She didn't have a black eye or anything later either, and he hit her hard. Yeah. Hun sends over a fruit basket for Cleopatra, and she and Hercules laugh while they share it. Ha ha ha, the silly little man Brett sent us food. Yeah, they're playing him. Yeah. He's playing him. She's playing him. The next We're day, back. Frida and Venus are talking about Hans and Frida's problems. Hans keeps giving Cleopatra money and gifts, and Frida doesn't like it. Cleopatra is clearly taking advantage of the little man, but he doesn't see it. They all laugh at the little guy. Many of the freaks don't like Cleopatra, since she's normal and looks down on all the real freaks. Mm -hmm. Venus and Froso are romantically involved. Daisy and Violet, the Siamese twins, are also having two separate affairs. Which they don't get onto it too much in the movie, but... How does that even work? Boy, that'd be strange. But Siamese twins have. Uh, the the actual Siamese twins mm-hmm. had wives and multiple children each. And be, I, I don't know. They deal with that. Awkward. It. Yeah, just ignore it. You know, tune it out, read a book. <laughs> <laughs> Pay no attention. Yeah. <laughs> well, the other side would feel it, but, wouldn't they? No. Mm. No. Not, no. Cleopatra keeps stringing hands along while splitting the loot with Hercules. Frida and Hans argue about Cleopatra. Hans has inherited a fortune. Cleopatra hears about the fortune and starts seeing Hans in a whole different light. She comes up with a plan on the spot. Marry Hans and kill him. We fast forward to the wedding night, and everyone is happy and drunk except for Frida. Yeah, and what a party. All of them around the table, all the freaks. (laughs) That was a good scene. Yeah, it was. Hans watches as Cleopatra kisses Hercules just to make him jealous. She's poisoned his drink. The freaks all chant, 
Gobble gobble, not gobble gobble. I think it's gobble, gobble. Gobble. Google gobble, Google gobble, Google gobble, Google gobble, Google gobble. I'm going to say this all night now. I'm in the room, in the move. Google yeah. gobble, Google <laughs> gobble. They, we accept her, one of us. One Google of gobble, us. we one accept her, one of us, one of us. <laughs> and it's kind of a creepy chant. Kinda, yeah. Cleopatra yeah. is now part of the tribe. She freaks. She freaks out, freaks out. calling them all freaks. Oh, she's drunk too. And yeah, that doesn't help. No. She doesn't appreciate their acceptance, and she screams at everyone. And then Hans passes out. Drunk or poisoned, we don't know. I think she'd started poisoning him at that point. Oh, yeah, she had. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Venus goes to Hercules and threatens to call the police if he doesn't fix things. It's been a week since Cleo poisoned Hans, but Hans is still bedridden. She fixes him more medicine, medicine. and yeah. she's putting something else in there, too. One of the dwarves watches her through the window. Hans spits the medicine out while she's not looking. Yeah, there's Every... a shorter guy who who is only two foot eleven who is in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of characters I'm not even talking about. Yeah, a lot of a lot of yeah. oddities. Yeah, and everyone knows what she's up to, including Hans. But now he has a plan too. Hercules tries to kill Venus, but Froso intervenes. The wagon tips over in the rain, and everyone moves outside into the storm and the mud. Hercules is surrounded by armed dwarves and pinheads crawling through the muck after him. Hydrocephalic. Mm-hmm. Some of the dwarves get Little their revenge people. with them too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy, the, letter, the letters were gonna get differently abled. I mean, there's okay, yeah. I mean, there's politically correct. So, yeah. so pardon our language. The whole movie is an exploitation it, film. So give me was. a break. Here. Yeah, that's why it's so controversial then and now. Yeah, yeah. the dwarves get no. their revenge on Cleopatra. We then flash back to the present, and the carnival barker shows us what became of Cleopatra. The freaks turned her into a duck. Yeah, I don't know how that yeah, happened, how but it's basically what she that, looks like now. Yeah. Years later, Venus and Froso bring Frida to see Hans, now fully recovered and obviously very wealthy. The two of them finally get together and have a happy ending. Dun, dun, dun. Mm-hmm. For being as old as it is, this looked pretty sharp. Yeah. Okay. This story is fairly, I, I mean, this is like the second oldest movie we've seen. And it looked pretty, it looked better than a lot of them. Yeah. The story is fairly weak, but the film is clearly just an excuse to see all the interesting characters. There are a lot of unique characters here, far more than I can mention in this brief review. Mm-hmm. There are lots of strange people off on the sides in the background that really aren't important to the story, but, but get a good look them, at them anyway. Yeah, in the background you'll see uh, there's a human skeleton. and Sword swallow. Uh, beard, and... Bearded woman and uh, Johnny Eck, who was, he was the half man. The guy he's, with no legs. Yeah. 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 He's not there for birth This de- guy with no legs, he's, he's something to watch. Yeah. The, he walks on his hands and he's he is. fast. And yeah, there he's was basic, he was basically a One gymnast. scene Kevin pointed out where they're all looking at Hans in bed. And the, the bed has these two bed posts at the end. And he climbs up there just with his hands because he got no legs. And then he puts one hand down to hold himself up on the bed post. Yeah, for the whole scene, he's just standing there on one hand. And he's not straining. He does this a lot, it looks Look, like. Makes it look real easy. Yeah, yeah. He does. Yeah. Uh, if you're a fan of the Ameri- of American Horror Story, you'll see a lot of similarities with the freak show season. Yeah. And I think they clearly mm-hmm. based a lot of those characters and designs from this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of the characters look almost identical. Yeah. One thing I wonder, though, if Hans, Hans was that rich, why, why did he keep he working a... at the freak show when everybody there hated him and made fun of him? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That was kind of a... It seemed totally yeah. not necessary. But this was fascinating. You know, if you if you watch this movie, you should also look on IMDb and do some Google searches on these people. There's all kinds of interesting... They lived full lives and interesting lives and you know the most of them into their 70s and 80s yeah yeah, yeah. long lives and there was one guy that uh he had no arms no legs multiple children you know had a wife and many many children no the, arms no the, legs but the caterpillar the, well, guy one 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 appendage that did work oh, apparently so yeah working to his strengths there the yeah he he uh they actually reduced his, uh, they cut the scene somewhat, but he rolls a cigarette with his lips and lights it and smokes a cigarette. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just, you know, with his lips. <laughs> there was one scene of somebody with no arms that was eaten with her feet. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah a, a, gal, about that a gal with no, no mm-hmm. arms, yeah, and her, her foot's up. She's using it like a hand. Yeah, yeah I, I think the it, shocking part of this that may, makes it so, I don't, I hesitate to say offensive, but makes it so shocking at the time was the fact that they were all real Mm -hmm. and it is very much an exploitation type thing like i said the story is not that good the acting is not that good but it's neat to see all these things yeah yeah it was Mm 
Zoo takes us to our bonus movie this week called The Fair from 2019. That's F-A-R-E, like taxi payment. And it wasn't horror. <laughs> it kind of could be related oh, vaguely. Oh, I guess there's sort of, yeah, okay, vaguely, <laughs> barely. <laughs> This one was submitted to us. We watched it and said, hey, we got to fit that in the show somehow. Because it was really good. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. Yeah. Directed by D.C. Hamilton, written by Brenna Kelly. Stars Gino Anthony Pesci, Brenna Kelly, and Jason Stewart, hour and 22 minutes. And this comes out on November 19th. So it's not out right now, but it will be out next week. Are we okay reviewing it? Yes, now? we are. Okay. On all yeah, the uh, major streaming networks. Okay. Amazon yeah. and all those. And not Not Netflix, I don't think, but the others. And we recommend it. Yeah. yeah. Don't give spoilers. I never do, do I? Yes. <laughs> well, we seem to be in a black be and white... gentle on this one. Okay. It needs gentle, a gentle touch. <laughs> we seem to be in a black and white world as a cab drives through the desert. The cab driver is listening to the radio and goes past a show where they're talking about time-traveling aliens that messed with the nature of reality. <clears throat> maybe it was a sci-fi show or maybe it wasn't. He's got a fair... Oh, I just think it was a wacky talk show. You know, well, whack, later whack, on we figure that out. out. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. In the, in immediately, though, I'm thinking like, oh, this is a tip-off. No, no. He's got a fair to pick up out in the desert. He's Harris and she's Penny. They talk about various things. She teaches people how to be strippers, and he talks about comic books. They flirt with each other and then drive into a thunderstorm. There's a flash of lightning, and Penny is gone. She's vanished. He calls it into the dispatcher and then looks at the meter. We then hear about time traveling aliens on the radio again. Yeah, he resets the meter and He's goes gone back to the back beginning. Back to the point before before he picked up Penny. Save point. He yeah. stops or and picks up like Penny that. again. <laughs> he doesn't seem to remember any of it, but it's just like the first time, except a little different. They hit something and they're suddenly in color. And he remembers her name, even though she hasn't told him that yet. I didn't tell you my name this time, she says. This time. Remember what? me this time, she says. <laughs> And then she vanishes. He flips the meter and time resets again back to black and white time. He stops to pick her up again, and we get flashes of color this time. Whenever he remembers, we see color. With old stuff that's not remembered, it's monochrome. Yeah, that was neat. They talk about what's going on, and she says there have been at least a hundred repeats. And she remembers all of them. She vanishes, he resets. This time, they both remember and skip the reruns. Penny explains that they've tried to go other places on previous trips, but the roads are always blocked, and the same thing always happens eventually. They repeat many, many more times, but now they always remember, and they get to know each other very well, with one long conversation after another between the resets. Eventually, Harris decides not to flip the switch. He doesn't turn the meter off, which seems to be what causes the resets. And then things get really different mm -hmm. yeah it's only marginally horror related at the end it's really much more of a romantic fantasy but it was really good yeah there's was. no blood or gore or violence but there is a monster of sorts just two actors and no three if you include the guy on the radio well, okay yeah some of the, the passengers dispatcher. in the back yeah dispatcher oh yeah that's right there was yeah. there were more than just yeah there, there were more <clears throat> yeah this is a concept we've seen done everywhere from groundhog day to star trek to happy death day and this film takes the same basic idea and does a lot of new things with it. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, yeah. when the show tries this basic storyline, Star Trek Next Generation, I'm looking at you, <laughs> I get bored by the third repeat, but this was different enough right away to keep my interest. Even after the repeating stops, it's still interesting. Actually, it goes a direction I was completely not expecting, nope, I wasn't and I really like the explanation, which really does work well. Yeah. The two main actors are both excellent, the writing and direction are good, and everything looks really good. Some of the exterior shots are a mixture of a real car and CGI, but it all works. Probably the best part is how it all ties together in the end and gets explained in a satisfying manner. Again, it only sort of barely touches on a horror topic, but I still very much recommend it. Me too. And it'll be released on Blu-ray and video on-demand sites in on November 19th next week. Hmm. All righty. Okay. That's a wrap, eh? So is there anything this week that we didn't like? Well... I'd I give a thumb sideway for the morbid. Um, Edmund yeah, Drood was, was, was a little on the lame side. I would say Drood was really... Drood, Drood was the weak was point. Was lame yeah. for me, yeah. That and was, that was best... The weak one. Um, <clears throat> I liked Freaks more than I should have, probably. I liked Freaks a lot, yeah. And The Fair was That was, that was my second good. time seeing it. I think of all these, I liked The Fair the best. Mm-hmm. No. The one that's not no horror. One that's not horror. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's our show. 
Thanks for joining us. Stop in during the week at HorrorGuys.com. All these reviews show up during the week, and then we talk about them afterwards. So if you want a preview, go there first. Ooh. Uh, and comment on the podcast or contact us. Our email is HorrorGuysMail at gmail.com. And get ready for next week, where we'll be discussing some Halloween, not Halloween, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving turkey. We've got a we've got a, a holiday coming up. Yeah, yeah. we're going to talk about Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving three, Blood Freak, and Poultry Geist. <laughs> Sounds like delicious fun to me. Mm-hmm. So uh, check us out. I'm Brian. I'm Kevin, and we'll see you next week. Bye bye.